Billy, when you think of Ron Sano, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, when I think of Ron Sano, I think when we first uh, played at San Antonio, I was at San Antonio, and uh, he was a young kid coming from Seattle, signing a contract. Uh, you know, I think he drove his Impala down there. But, you know, he he was just a gung-ho player, you know, wanted to win at all costs, uh, made himself a great baseball player because he was a catcher. He signed as a catcher, and then he was uh, uh, made a third baseman. You know, he changed position at San Antonio, and uh, he took to it like a duck out of water, duck in water. You know, he he, he was a great ball player. And he he didn't change that gung-ho that, uh, mentality once he hit the big leagues, did he? No, he, he really didn't, because uh, when, he, when Leo first came here, of course, he was named captain, I think, before Leo got here, if not. When uh, Leo got here, uh, Leo had heard a lot of talk about Ron Santo and the type of game he played, and, and uh, he named him captain of the ball club. And it was a thing that uh, it was just a title because, uh, you know, we looked up to each other. But uh, he gave Santo the, the title captain of the ball club. So uh, with that in mind, you know, we, we, we had a good baseball team. We, we, we policed our own self. We wanted to go out and perform and, and, and win all, you know, win at all costs. I was at the Ron Sano golf outing uh, about two years ago, and I remember Randy Huntley telling a story. You guys played a trick on him, you and Huntley, with a uh, <laughs> clock. Do you want to tell that story? With what? With a clock you put in his locker? Oh, oh that was, uh, that was uh, Glenn Beckett and myself. You know, in, in the locker room, I was placed on the end, and, of course, uh, Beckett was next to me, and uh, Sano was uh, the third chair down. And on the other side, you had Ernie and uh, and Fergie. It made it easy for us because we were senior members of the ball club, and we didn't have to go that far to go up and take a shower. We'd just walk up about four or five steps and take a shower. But this particular day, right after we got back from New York, and I think Sano got some threats up there because, uh, you know, anytime somebody – you know, talk about the Cubs, they're going to talk about Sano and how gung-ho he is to win. And we were playing in, in uh, New York, and I think Sano had to leave coming back uh, from New York because he got a threat in New York. So we were in the clubhouse, and this particular day it rained. And well, you have several guys, they playing cards, that they're doing different things. So uh, Beckett and I got this idea, you know, because he'd been getting threats we're going to threat him a little bit more. So so I'd call a bat boy down, and I told him I put uh, went up to Shuneman. Al Shuneman was a trainer. And I put this, uh, put this uh, told him, uh, let me use your clock for a minute. Matter of fact, I didn't ask him. I just took it, you know. And uh, we went. I went down and wrapped it up in one of the – I took a baseball out of a box and put it in a box and – you know, uh, wrapped it up pretty good. And I told the bad boy, I said, uh, don't give it to him now. Take it all the way upstairs, get a stamp, and like it came from New York, and put it down by his locker. So in the meantime, Beckett and I had talked about this, and we're going to play this thing on Ron Sano, you know. So it was raining. We we didn't get a chance to go to the baseball field. So after he bring all the mail, we sitting around reading our mail, and all of a sudden... You know, we heard this ticking, and Beck said, uh, Billy, you hear that? I said, no, I don't hear that. Then I listened real close again. I said, wow, I hear something ticking. I hear something ticking down there. In the meantime, they had set it right in front of Santa, Santa Locker, and uh, the thing was ticking. And uh, I said, yeah, I hear that. And Beck said, I hear it too. And, and both of us, at that time, we jumped up and took off, okay? We jumped off and took off up in the training room. And in the meantime, you know, as we come down in the clubhouse, we had to go up about five or six steps. And then you could look out and see the fire station over there. And all of a sudden, Ronnie took off and said, it's a bomb. <laughs> so he took off and ran upstairs and threw the thing, <laughs> threw the thing across the street, you know. And uh, he came back in the clubhouse, and, and uh, Beckett and I was just dying. We were laughing, man. We saw him so so, so ticked off. And uh, in the meantime, you know, he got pissed off at us. He was chasing us in the clubhouse, and the trainer was looking for his timer. So everybody was going around looking for different things. But uh, 
that's one of the things that kind of the stuff we used to have a lot of fun with each other, you know. That's a great story. <laughs> Do you have to end up paying I for still, a, a new st- clock? I still laugh about it. Oh, yeah, we had to buy Shinneman a new clock, <laughs> a time clock. Yeah, he was looking for it. Where my clock? You know, and it was across the street, almost landed on, the, you know, inside the fire station over there. But Beck and I, we, we had this wise idea. We sit there by the lock, and, and we just had a great time. Those are the kind of things we used to do. You know, we had a lot of fun with each other. I was just saying the other day when we was in, in Dominican, uh, Sano and I played in the minor league maybe about about five years, four years, and uh, well, three and a half years, and all that time in the big league. So that's pretty close to 18 years we played together. So, you know, that's about nine years that that we were together at the ballpark because we spent a lot of time, six months out of a year, we playing baseball in Chicago, and we're spending that time on the road. So we got to know each other real well, I think. We clicked it off in spring in uh, San Antonio when we were down there. As a matter of fact, uh, everywhere that uh, one of us went to play, uh, the other one was there. So uh, they, they had a tennis to put us together, and they were planning on us to come to the big league to help Randy. Is there any talk of putting a Ron Sano statue up, what they did for you and they did for Ernie, ba- uh, Ernie Banks? Is is what? Is there any what? talk of a Ron Sano statue going up in the near future? Not yet, not yet at this time, but I imagine I imagine it will happen because uh, you know you can't separate uh, Sano uh, from Ernie and myself. Uh, we made a great lineup. You know there were times I hit uh, third and Sano was fourth and Ernie hit fifth. So uh, you know we did that, and of course the Ernie statue was uh, erected. Mine was erected uh, this year, so. You know, I, I imagine Sano uh, Satchel won't be that far behind because it went in that in that sequence as the flags flew. You know, Ernie flag, my flag, and then uh, then Rhino's fl- then uh, Sano's flag. You're like the so three I amigos. Somewhere, I imagine somewhere in in the near future, this will happen. Is there any talk of who's going to replace him as the Cubs uh, radio broadcaster? No, 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 no. You have to call uh, WGN, somebody who's over that department. I don't know yet, but it's going to be tough to uh, to replace a guy like that. I know he and uh, Pat Hughes had such a great time on radio, and and I've often said that, uh, you know, Ronnie and I have been together for so many years, and we've got a chance to know the families, uh, to enjoy each other, and, of course, uh, Shirley, my wife, has heard a lot of the stories and stuff he tell on say on television, but uh, she would turn the turn the television off and just listen to the radio because she still get a kick out of him say the things he say. Yeah, he he might not always describe uh, or analyze what was going on on the field, but for <laughs> entertainment value, they, they he and Pat. Uh, I, I I think that's one. Pat Pat had the stuff that uh, Pat. You know, he 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 told the stories that uh, you know what went on on the field, and I think Santa was more an entertainer, you know, on radio. He did a great job with it, and uh, you know, a lot of people loved him. A lot of people gonna miss that because I think uh, a lot of times, one twenty during a ball game, he kept a lot of people in stitches. They were laughing, uh, Sano, and every time he, you know, had to go somewhere and get checked out, or had to leave the ball club. I think a lot of people missed that because a lot of people, uh, whenever they found out he wasn't there, they would always ask me, what happened to Santa? Where is he? You know, as I'm walking in the ballpark. And uh, everybody everybody missed him then, and they were really going to miss him now. I think he took the losses when he was broadcasting harder than the players did. Well, Santa was that, that kind of individual. I think, uh, you know, everybody know he was a he was a Cub player, and, uh, and I became a Cub fan. And uh, as 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 we all say, you know, and the people that does the broadcasting like he does, he was a homie because he wanted the Cubs to win so bad. And you didn't have to uh, know the score or look at the scoreboard if you listened to a baseball game. If you hit a tone of his voice, you would know the, whether or not the Cubs winning or losing because he took the losses so hard. And, uh, you know, sometimes doing – you know, when we played, I, you know, I didn't like to see him take those games that hard because uh, he was a guy that, uh, you know, the, 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 if he did real good, you know, he'll get high and, and he would get too low, you know. So uh, he was that kind of individual, though. 
Yeah, at the same time, his sense of humor got a lot of listeners through a lot of ba- Cubs baseball. Well, it did. It did. And, and I think the combination of him and uh, Pat Hughes, they, they work so well together because there were many times that uh, Pat will kind of kid him a lot. I remember one incident that uh, this one individual had been called up to the big league about, uh, I guess, about two or three months prior to uh, getting a base hit. Ronnie said, uh, you know, all of a sudden he'll ask Pat, said, uh, Pat, what did he do? He wind up on second base. The kid got a base hit and wind up on second base. And Pat, Pat would say, uh, uh, Ronnie would say, Pat, how did he get on? And Pat would tell him to get a base hit, got it double. You know, he's on second base. And he was said, uh, when, 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 when did he come up to the big league? Pat said, he only been here about two months now, Ronnie. <laughs> but that's the way he was. That's the way he was. He really enjoyed the game. He enjoyed life, and he had a lot of fun. I, you know, I like the thing that, uh, you know, as, as much disappointment that he's had over the years, he made a lot of people happy by raising a lot of money, you know, for JDF. He really enjoyed doing that, you know, and this is why everybody, when he had his golf tournament, and I would, that was the first day I was marked down, say I'm looking forward to playing in that golf tournament because I know it's helping him because he's so proud of what he's doing for JDF. Yeah, you, you look at his legacy and you, you can think about baseball, you can think about radio, but really mm-hmm. the, the lasting legacy that, JDF. Uh, some some somebody said it the other day. You know, he's nine innings over it. Now he's the next inning. You know, after after he got all the diabetes and you know he he had to have his legs amputated. And from that time to this time, he was the next inning. You know, he lived a good life. He lived a good life, and uh, you know he 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 enjoyed it. And uh, he he made sure a lot of lot more people, a lot other people enjoyed it. That's what upsets me with a lot of people are saying he didn't take care of himself, this, this, and this. You know what? He had diabetes when people know a lot about it. He had mm-hmm. to eat the candy bars to get the levels back up. And basically, yeah. he lived life to the fullest. And a lot of people criticize his broadcasting, but he broadcast like he played. He played hard, took the losses hard, and I wish today's players would feel the same way. Yeah, well, we all wish that. But, uh, you know, when you speak of the candy bars and stuff, he he kept it from his teammates a long time. We didn't know he was a diabetic. You know, when uh, after playing for so many years with him here in Chicago, <clears throat> we didn't know that uh, he had to have these uh, candy bars during the game. We didn't know he was a diabetic. And, uh, when did you guys train, find out about this? Uh, well, we, I, I, guess about, I guess about seven years after he, he was in the big league, you know, playing with him because it, begin to get out there. But uh, the candy bars used to be in a little pouch. Al Schooneman used to have little candy bars in the, in the pouch. And they were far running. You know, it would get hot there. They had to have some sugar. And he would eat those candy bars. But there were several times that uh, those candy bars wasn't there because we didn't know he was diabetic. And Beckett and I, we used to raid that little pouch and get those <laughs> candies out of there. So uh, we kind of took that away from it at that time, you know. But... Uh, <clears throat> He kept it a long time. It's amazing to know that he did what he did as a baseball player. He had to have uh, insula every morning, and uh, you know he had to shoot himself before he go to the ballpark. <laughs> so he just he just did a lot for what he had to offer. You don't realize how much Ron was loved to hear all the tributes to him over the past week. Well, it's just been amazing, and. Uh... You know, it was just a, a, quite a shock, honestly, when I, I got up that morning and early in the morning, I had an email from someone telling me what had happened, and you just go through such a range of emotions, you know, it's shock, it's sadness, and then it's, uh, you know, you remember so many great things and so many fond memories, and so you just go through such a range of emotions in a very quick period of time. You got to play alongside him for a long time there. I certainly did. I was privileged to be able to do that. But, you know, it's, it, it's well documented. I think how great a player Ron was in baseball, and there's just no doubt about that. But for those of us that had the privilege of playing with him for so many years, uh, you know, it, it's even greater the teammate and friend he was. You played for the White Sox. Ron played for the White Sox, but Ron only played one year. He had a two-year contract. He said, I had enough. I don't want to play second base. They got Bill Melton now. Was that his personality, that he was so competitive, he had to be his way or no way? Well, 
Now, I don't know. It was just sometimes things work and sometimes things don't work, and I just think that that deal with Ron going to the White Sox just didn't turn out to be a good situation, really, for him. And so, uh, you know, he was going to – he had two years maybe, and he but he just played one and said, okay, heck, that's enough. I mean, he walked away from a quarter million dollars. Not many people would do that back in that time. No, that's a fact. That's, that's a fact. A quarter million yeah. was a quarter million. He did, but 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 Ron, you know, Ron just he loved baseball. He loves the Cubs. He just it, it was a hard transition for him, and and probably a hard transition a little bit for the fans over there, and and it just was one of those things that didn't work. And uh, I have great respect for him. He wasn't having fun, so it was time to quit. And he he seems like a guy who. Liked his fun. Is that accurate? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. But but Ron had a passion for baseball and a and a, a passion for the Cubs. And so uh, he just really enjoyed what he was doing. you got to give the guy credit. I mean, the Cub fans love him. I mean, I know Ernie Banks is Mr. Cub, but I think Ernie made a mistake basically leaving the Chicago area after he retired. But Ron stayed here. And I think Ron is more associated with the Cubs than Ernie Banks because a lot of people not only know Ron from playing, but also from broadcasting. <laughs> well, you know, actually, uh, I mean, both those guys are so so loved by uh, by all the Cub fans. I, I don't know which one was more, but I, I do know that that I think for Ron, it was an extremely smart move staying. And I was thrilled when he got the opportunity to be on the air uh, doing the Cub games. And 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 look, he just loved it. I mean, he truly loved it. I could flip that radio on, and, you know, now with satellite radio, I could listen to him a lot, and I'd, I'd flip that radio on, and I could tell in 10 seconds whether the Cubs were winning or losing, <laughs> listening to Ron. Right, and he had that same passion as a broadcaster, I imagine, as he did as a ball player. Oh, he look, he did. And, and I mean this. We, hear, we say this kind of stuff all the time, but honestly, goodness, I don't know if I know anyone and all of us love the Cubs, but I don't know if I know anyone that loved the Cubs more than Ronnie. Oh, he loved I mean, I laugh with my wife. I'd be driving in the car, and she doesn't want to listen to sports, but I'd put the Cubs game on, and she wouldn't mind because it's like, what's Ronnie going to say next? Because you don't know what was coming out of his mouth. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty. O- he was a pretty open book when he was doing those games. And, but I, I tell you, he's just, he's just an endeared guy. I mean, we all loved him, and... and uh, yeah, it's just been tough. It's been pretty tough. But boy, do we have some great memories. And uh, and I'm going to tell you, having had the privilege of playing beside him, playing shortstop and Ronnie playing third, he, he just was – people don't realize how good a defensive third baseman Ron Santo was. And, and maybe even playing beside him. Maybe I didn't realize how good he was until, you know, he wasn't there anymore. And then all of a sudden you realize, goodness, I'm trying to get to balls I didn't used to have to get to because right. Ronnie got them. Yeah, how many ground balls do you figure he got a season uh, that you didn't have to? I don't know. There were a lot because he, he played a wide third base, which helps the shortstop. And he had good range to his left. And uh, and, and it was one of those deals. We played together so long. Ron, I, I kind of knew what he was going to do. He knew what I was going to do. And Certain situations, if I caught a ball going to my right, he knew those times I might come to him instead of going to first to get a guy going to second. It was just such a wonderful feeling to have a great player like that playing beside you. You won two gold gloves. You had Becker winning gold gloves, and you had Ron. I mean, you had a great infield back then in the late 60s, early 70s. Well, we did. We we honestly did have a have a great infield. You know, it's kind of like Becker told me one time, though. They called us the million dollar infield, and Beck said, "Yeah, but nine hundred thousand of it's on the corners." <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there's a lot of truth in that. But uh, we did. We were privileged to play together. Uh, I, I guess one of my greatest thrills is playing in an All Star game when all the whole Cub infield was representing the National League. That's quite a tribute. Definitely, and then you have a Hall of Fame left fielder in Billy Williams, and then people wonder, how did they not win a World Series or even get to one? Yeah, yeah, we all kind of wonder that. I mean, it, you know, honestly, if it was like today, we would have at least been in the playoffs and had right. a chance to win several times. You know, then you had to win your division or you were done, and we just came up short. Uh, if we had won in 69, I, I think we might have won two or three of the next five years after that. It was just, uh, but I guess, it, you know, it wasn't meant to be, and uh, we hate it. We hate it so badly, but uh, 
we certainly do have a lot of memories from it, and a lot of great friends came out of it. Was there any animosity between all you guys being stars, or did everyone get along all the time? Oh, no. I, I've never played on a team where a group of guys got along so well. I, I don't believe that there was any uh, any anybody envied what somebody else was doing at all. I think we just pulled real hard for each other, and that's another thing I could say for Ronnie. I mean, he wanted everybody on that team to do good. It wasn't that he didn't want somebody to do something better than him, and, and no, it was a great feeling. Do you think Ronnie's going to get in the Hall of Fame now that he died, that there's even more attention to him not being in? Well, Ronnie should be in the Hall of Fame, in, in my humble opinion. And uh, it, it, to me, it, it's uh, certainly I think he should, but the shame of it is it would have meant so very much to Ron Santo to have, have known, to have been here when it happened. And so I, I deeply regret that that didn't happen. And as you say, it, it doesn't do much good now. Well, it certainly would it, it would have done more good had Ron been here to experience it, and, and I think he should have. Yeah. But, you know, he was a Hall of Famer for his off-field activities, too, you know. And I think that, as I said to others who've been on this show, that that's his true legacy, and that's the measure of the man. Ron has been an inspiration uh, and uh, to me and I'm sure to many of my teammates and with the physical trials that he's gone through. Uh, in the last several years, his his attitude and his courage have been a a real inspiration to me. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know about you, but I never heard him complaining. He didn't. I mean, not to me. When I, the times I saw him, he uh, he was just glad to be there and right. uh, made everybody feel good. I know Yosh Kwano loved him. Oh, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, you know, most of everybody loved Ronnie. He just, you know, Ronnie was pretty vocal. He, you always knew what Ronnie was thinking. I mean, it wasn't any, there wasn't any any mystery to uh, what Ronnie's thoughts were. And but uh, he was such a team player, and he loved everybody, and it, it he was loved in return. I'm surprised he never became a major league manager. Who, Ron? Ron. Well, I don't know. You know, it just those kind of things. Just sometimes either you have the opportunity to do it or not, but. You know, I don't know. He he, uh, he loved what he was doing, uh, being with the Cubs. He loved broadcasting for the Cubs. So, you know, that may have been the best thing for him. And I think managing may have driven him crazy. Well, managing can do that. <laughs> I'll tell you that. What a lot of people don't realize is Milt Pappas was up for that job. It was between Milt and Roddy. It could have been a whole different ball game. Well, I, say that again. I apologize. No problem. What a lot of people don't realize is that job was up between Ron Santo and Mo Pappas getting it. So it could oh, have, for the broadcasting, for the broadcasting yes. job. Yes, absolutely. And while either one of them would have done fine, uh, it was just, I tell you, Ron's just been, an, he, he's been, uh, he's been Ron Santo. And that's the only way I know to say that because he's just, a, you know, he's different up there. He says what he thinks. You, you feel what Ron Santo thinks. And uh, that's a great thing. When you got the news last week about Ron, what was your first thought? Well, surprised, I guess, but not unexpected. You know, it, uh, he's had so many, so many adversities in his life that, you know, you just don't know when, you know, the man upstairs is going to say, okay, you know, you've had enough, my friend. Come on upstairs. And, uh, yeah, you know, he was, Ronnie was, you know, in, as good a health, I guess, as he could be, and it's just a shame that, you know, that he uh, did not make the Hall of Fame before, you know, before he died. It's 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 a it's a crying shame that he he's not in there. Yeah, but to, uh, even though he didn't make baseball's Hall of Fame, to a lot of uh, listeners and Cubs fans, he's in a, a special Hall of Fame for all the work he did off the field. Oh yeah, with the uh, junior diabetes. Right. And, yeah, Ron, Ron was a very, you know, very unique individual and, you know, good ball player, good guy. And, you know, and, you know, he loved people and, you know, he, people come up and ask for autographs. You know, he was gracious, you know, not like the guys of today and, you know, who won't sign for anything or anybody. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I enjoyed being with Ron the time I was with him and the four years and, of course, all the off seasons at the cup conventions and, different functions so you know i've known ronnie for what call almost 30 years ronnie had two careers with the cubs as a player and as a broadcaster but a lot of people don't realize that 
he almost didn't get that job because it was between you and him, wasn't it, for that broadcasting job? Yeah, there was. I guess I was uh, in the running. I found out later, and uh, you know, I guess the best man won. You know, and you know, he's he, he did a heck of a job on the radio. He, he was not a great announcer, but he was funny. You know, and and you know the 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 uh, Santo the Santoisms. You know when. And he, oh, no, and oh, right. my God, I could, no, not again. I mean, he was just, uh, you know, pronouncing names, and, you know, he had a hard time doing that. He was reminding me a lot of, of Harry Carey, you know, towards the end. He had a heck right. of a time pronouncing guys' names. and But he was he was funny to listen to. He, uh, you know, of course, he cried, you know, the cup blue like uh, Tommy Lasorda, you know, for years with, with Dodger blue. And, yeah, he's going to be missed. Yeah. I, and I don't think you're going to find another uh, broadcaster come along and have the style that Ron Santo had. I think those days of teams hiring guys like that have, have uh, passed. And well, you know, I hope you're wrong, but I, I, think I hope I'm wrong I think too. You're right. <laughs> you know that. You know, uh, I don't understand why not. I mean, you know, you've got you've got guys who played the game before and are colorful and in respects, and you know they they should be. You know, a lot is not being done for former players, and that, and I, I get very upset about that. And uh, you know, the White Sox are are decent with some, you know, with some of their former players. And when you walk into the stadium, you know, you see Nelly Fox's hot dogs or Minnie Minosa's pizzas or Billy Pierce's, you know, whatever. At least they do something for the former players. You know the. Unfortunately, the Cubs don't do a whole lot for former players, and you know we're working on that. Trying to, I think, with the new ownership and with, you know, with the with with the new guys and talking with Wally Hayward, the uh, director of marketing, and I think uh, I think they're going to try and utilize some of the former players, and as well they should. Why not? I mean, the fans would get a kick out of it. You know, I think we, it- should, we should be looking for Milt Pappas's Giros. <laughs> Not a bad idea, my friend. <laughs> we Not just a hit- bad idea. You know, yeah, I I sold that for many years, so you know, I'm very familiar with it. And uh, but I, I just feel that baseball is it's a different animal today. And you know, the, from the time of the year that I played in, and it's a shame. It's uh, you know, we only had 16 teams back in. You know, back then, and now there's 30, and the money is just unbelievable. And when you got guys hitting 220. You know, making millions of dollars, it just turns my stomach that, you know, those guys in my year would, would be in the minor leagues. They would have, they wouldn't have a chance to get to the major leagues with, with that kind of action. What What's a bigger crime? You getting robbed of the perfect game or Sano not being in the Hall of Fame? Oh, I would say that Ronnie not getting into the Hall of Fame. I mean, that's, you know, and uh, and like myself too, he didn't play in a World Series. You know, that's another big. Another big thing that Ronnie and I never were exposed to was playing in the World Series, and that you know All Star games. We both, you know, we both did that, and we both had you know decent careers, and we had you know a few years. He had 16 years in the majors. I think I I had 17. So you know, in respect, it was. uh, But you know, with his stats and him not not making in the Hall of Fame, and then you got you know you got guys like Lee Smith who should be in there. You know, and it, yeah, it's just uh, it's just astounding that the former that the Hall of Fame players who do the voting, I just don't understand their thinking. I mean, I, is it the good old boys club that you know they don't want anybody in there? Look at Bert Blylevin, two hundred and eighty wins. Come on. Do you think part of Sano's problem was the way he acted on the field after games, clicking the heels, that some of these players want to stick it to him and writers? No, not really, because uh, you know a lot of the guys that they got now, you know, didn't never saw them play. So they thought all they did, all they have to. Well, I mean, I shouldn't say that. Before the Hall of Famers got got the voting, the some of the sports writers, you know, they did the voting, you know, for the Hall of Fame, and oh, they never saw Ron play. So he had a piece of paper in front of him that sh- that showed his stats, and you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have a guy like Brooks Robinson playing behind me and Ron Sano. You know, to me, Brooks Robinson was the best third baseman i ever seen. But Ron Sano, I tell you, was right, right behind him. And 
as far as hitting. Ronnie Brooksy was 22 years. Ronnie played 16, and Ronnie had better better statistics in some areas, and you know RBIs and home runs, and you know and he had and Brooks had six more years on him, and it, he des, deserved to be in there. I mean the stats were there to be a Hall of Famer. I just, so I don't understand the, these guys today, the former players and who are the vote, you know, who do the voting that uh, can't put some of these guys in that really deserve it. What was he like as a teammate? Ronnie was, uh, well, uh, how, how do you put this? Ronnie was, was self-made. He, he knew he was good and he was, and you know, he was, he was a good teammate. He, he, like I said, you know, he, he talked to everybody and, if he needed help in, in any area, Ronnie was there, you know, to do it. And, you know, I loved the guy. His personality was fantastic. And he was just a, just a good guy to, to be around. And and uh, he wasn't quite as uh, jovial. He wasn't quite like Ernie did when you know, Ernie would immediately walk through the door and say, let's play too, you know, good day for baseball. And sometimes guys had big hangovers and didn't, you know, <laughs> they'd like to punch him in the nose when he, comes in with, you know, with Ernie. Ernie never, Ernie was is a very unique individual too. I mean, the guy would come in and, and you know, he he'd make you feel good, you know, even though if you felt lousy. And and Ronnie too, you know, Ronnie was was not negative. He he played the game hard, and you know, unfortunately, uh, playing with the Cubs back in the era before lights, you know, you, know, you had to play summertime at Wrigley Field, and sometimes it gets very hot in Wrigley Field, and when you're playing a two-week stretch at home without a day off, you know, it, it got to you. It, it got to our guys in August and September. What's your favorite Ron Sano moment? My my favorite Ron Sano moment? Yes. I think it was after, uh, I think after my no-hitter in the locker room, Ronnie was talking to some of the newspaper men, and I overheard him say, you know, this is the first time I've ever had a letdown after a no-hitter. So I thought that. I thought that was a you know quite a that was a great statement, but uh, he he just uh, the the guy was there and I said he loved the game he loved putting a uniform on loved being with the Cubs and was just uh, just an all around good guy. What did he want more, the Hall of Fame or World Series ring? Who Ronnie? Ronnie. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Hall of Fame. I mean, you're there. You're enshrined. You know, you're there for the. You're there forever, you know. You know, even after you die, you're still, you know, you're still at the, uh, you're still in the Hall of Fame, and you know, like uh, I've got, I guess I'm in the Hall of Fame in Baltimore with the Orioles, and that will be there forever too. So even though it's not the, you know, the the big the big Hall of Fame, but hell, I'm still feel pretty good that I'll be there for <laughs> I'll be there forever way after I'm gone. Is there a defensive play he made when you were on the mound that? that stands out in your mind? Oh, that's, that, that, that's so hard to, uh, to say which it was. I mean, it was like, like I said, what, what, with Brooks Robinson. I mean, it was just, these guys were so good that it was, you know, like it just like they've done it all their lives. So it was like a routine play when, when they, when Ronnie would dive over the bag and make a play and throw the guy out or a line drive and, you know, going into the hole and he dive for it and, and catch it. I mean, to anybody else, it was one. It was one devastating play. But for these guys, you know, like for Ronnie, it was it was routine. They made it look so easy. It it, it that was unbelievable. Glenn, when you got the news last week of Ron's passing, what was your first thought? Yeah, I was kind of shocked because the prior week I talked to him. And I said, Ron, hey, Rooms, how you doing? He said, I'm doing great. But then I found out his son called me, Jeff, and also Vicky, his wife, and they says, well, here's the situation. He's been suffering for three months at least from the, the his cancer. Uh, the key, and the chemo, whatever. But his his theory was not to tell anybody. He didn't want the Cubs to know, the press to know, uh, anybody to know about this. And, I, you know, I was, in a way I was shocked about it. This is Elliot Harris from the Chicago Sun-Times. And the season ended. Ron went to Arizona, and, and that was the last we heard. You thought, okay, he's, 
he's in the sun, it's warm, <laughs> spring yeah. will come and he'll be back. And it, I think this was quite a shock to, to most everybody. Yes, it was. Uh, in fact, Ernie Banks called me. That's unusual for Ernie to call me. I believe the last time he called me was what the last time he was married. Told me about his wedding. <laughs> that had to be what seventeen, eighteen years ago. Uh, but Ernie was a little concerned. You know, he just heard this, and it's something because we're all on that same leg, you know, and uh, we're in line to go too someday. Glenn. A lot of talks were made that Ron would not want to go in the Hall of Fame if he didn't do it when he was living. What's your opinion on that? Well, I don't know. You know, Ron wanted in the Hall of Fame, which is only natural, a big thing. But what I don't understand, with his credentials are, are every bit as good as uh, Brooks Robinson. But the fact is, I think the situation, we've already had three guys in the Hall of Fame. And to put a, a fourth guy in, it looks a little funny when you never played in the World Series. Yeah. Brooks Robinson's acclaim came in the postseason. And that postseason, seems... you know, that's when he made, made these plays. He got some hits and outstanding defense and offense. And so that's more or less what, you know, Brooks is a great guy, great athlete. Glenn, you and I were talking last week. I know you're down in Florida. You couldn't believe the coverage he was getting on the national sports stations. I just couldn't believe it. I see him on I see him on ESPN. I see him on the... ABC News and CBS, and I'm saying, you know, I didn't know the power of working for the radio station was in such that great a thing. But with Ron, you know, and but the thing I liked most about it, Ron was not a successful, too good in the business world. Uh, so I think once he got that job, he was so thrilled. I think we went out to dinner that night. Uh, uh, and he was saying, this feels great. I'm back with the Cubs, and I feel absolutely excellent. So, in a way, I think that's what kept Ron going. It wasn't making pizzas? <laughs> no. Oh, hey, 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 don't tell me. I was partners with him. I was oh. involved with it. I made 6000 my first year, and I think I spent 2000 on that pizza investment. Whose idea was that? Uh, well, we had a friend, I forget what his name was, uh, He's also passed away, but another Italian friend of, of, of Ron's. Uh, and I, I forget the name since I bumped my head. I can't remember that much anymore. But uh, I remember those uh, those pizzas advertised. It says, look for, our, look for us in your grace, uh, grocery, uh, you know, whatever. So anyway, they, you know what they were? Hockey pucks. <laughs> well, at least they served a purpose. So the only um, dough that you were, the only dough you were rolling around in was in pizza dough. I'm telling you, I don't know, but I took just hot and heated, and I had a roller skating, uh, not a roller, but ice skating rink out in, in Palatine, <laughs> and I said, "Let's, we're out of a hockey pot." I said, "Let's use this." <laughs> so uh, that was not a. Let's move on to something else. That yeah. wasn't a good deal. Yeah. Oh. Ron really did have another Cubs career. When he went into radio, it, I think he... Uh, it was a, it was big for him, believe me. Yeah, I mean, the big. whole generations and uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people oh, who, yeah. who hadn't seen him play somehow made a connection with him through his work on WGN. In, the past five years, he was not a good help, you know, what he went through, but he was he was a survivor and never complained. Uh, he was just good about things. Now, what, and, uh, when he was playing... I, I was, gave him a lot of credit. During his playing days, would he get as emotional on the bench as he seemed to get in the broadcast booth? Just, five, just all the time. And Ron was a great dancer, believe me. I, well, I should say that we picked that up on the road trips. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was a great dancer, and he just was—he just left it out. He had—he didn't keep it in his, in his brain to analyze. He just came right out with it. Uh, so he was more or less our, our captain on the team. Uh, and I was lucky enough to uh, room with Ron. I'm uh, six years, six months old, younger than he is. But Ron came up to 60, and I didn't come up to 65. Uh, it was a big thing. Uh, I it, waited until I graduated from college. and then. But anyway, got there, and Ron more or less uh, asked me if I want to room with him. And I said, oh, you bet you, Ron. You're one of those stars in that. Uh, and... Uh, I, I joke around about a thing, and then I says three years later, I said, well, I found out about that. Nobody else wanted to room with him. <laughs> was he a good roommate, or was he kind of a slob? Yeah, he was good. We only had two 
two little spats, I'd say, over a nine-year period, but uh, very minor. But not only that, our families were friendly. Our kids were raised knowing each other. Uh, his uh, previous wife was Judy Sano, and we went went out to dinner with them. Uh, we went skating, went on vacations all together. So we more or less saw what was happening. And spring training, Ron, we had these connections. He had a beautiful uh, place where we could stay and uh, right next to each other. What? And uh, it was it was just a nice experience for me. I was very lucky. Did he have all, all his hair in those days, or had he gotten to the toupee yet? Uh well, that started, I would say, in 68. And uh, I don't want to comment on that. Waking, <laughs> up in the, waking up in the morning when he had those first couple models on his bed post, uh, you know, it was a little different. <laughs> was Ron as competitive off the field as he was on? Well, yeah. Ron, we all like to win at everything we do. Uh, Ron, I love to play those cards, but in the, if we play... Uh, some sort of card game on a plane, uh, and uh, if he lost, continues to lose, lost. there goes the deck in here. Get a new deck. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just Ron Sano. I'll tell you what, a lot of people relate Harry Carey with the Cubs, but Harry only broadcast the Cubs for about 15, 16 years. Ron went 20 years broadcasting the Cubs more than Ron, Harry. Ron, I'm telling you, and uh, – if I was driving back or listening to him, and all of a sudden I'd pick up and turn on WGN and it's where I could get it, and I'd hear Ron, I could tell immediately if it comes from winning and losing, just by hearing his voice. You know, so, uh, well, he and I were the best of friends. But, uh, I'll tell you what really Ron was outstanding for is doing the work he did for uh, juvenile diabetics, diabetes and that. He did a wonderful job raising money, trying to find a cure for it. Uh, he was friendly. He, if you had a child and you said, well, I wonder if Ron Sandler would talk to him, he'd, he'd drive to the house and see the kid. So you got to give him credit on that. Glenn, I want to thank you very much for your time. Let you get back to your driving. Ellie and I really appreciate you coming on for a few minutes. Well, it's, it's a thing I'm nice to be. You know, I, I tease everybody. I said, at 70 years old, I'm glad somebody calls me. <laughs> But anyway, I thank you guys, and uh, we're going to miss them. Okay. Bring your top coat. I will. I know. Here's a little chilly. <laughs> okay. Thank you again, Glenn. Right. See you all later. All righty. On the phone with us, we've got Cubs, former Chicago Cub, and Major League Baseball Hall of Famer Fergie Jenkins. How are you doing today, Fergie? I'm doing fine, guys. It's been a sad week with the passing of Ron. What's your thoughts on what happened with Ron? Well, it's really too bad. I know that he battled that bladder cancer probably for the last uh, maybe four or five years. I know that uh, he stopped doing road trips because of the fact that they have got too much for him to uh, travel. So it was kind of a, a situation that, you know, inevitably, uh, unfortunately, uh, he succumbed to it, but it's really too bad. Now, when you were out on the mound pitching uh, for the Cubs, what was it like knowing you had a third baseman of that caliber out there? Oh. Well, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, Ronnie was a one heck of a third baseman. He won some gold gloves. And, and what was nice is that, you know, he was a great defensive player. I mean, he made phenomenal plays uh, day in and day out. And, and I, he just got to the point where people just, they didn't want to hit it down to third base. He was, he was like a Brooks Robinson. And uh, rightly so, because he was an all-star at that position uh, well over nine times. What's your thoughts on him not being in the Hall of Fame? Would you think he would want to get in posthumously? Well, it, it's going to probably happen, and his two boys will probably accept the award for him, and it's really unfortunate he couldn't have had that honor to, to, to receive it himself and utilize that part of what the game's all about. But uh, it just didn't happen, and now we're hoping that he, he'll get that opportunity to maybe go in and his son will re represent him. Now, the intensity he brought as a broadcaster, I assume he had at least as much as a player. Did he ever vent at you? Oh, we used to get this in discussions uh, a lot of times. Uh, he'd come into the to the mouth, say, "Hey, you can't pitch that guy that way," or "You got to look at this this situation and that situation." Or he'd bring it up in the locker room after a ball game. This is why we won, and we got to continue to do it that way. But Ronnie was the team captain, and let me know. Let me tell you, he let you know what was going on on a daily basis. You were the pitcher coach for the Cubs in the '90s. Did he ever do that when he was broadcasting after a game or before a game? Tell you what you should do. 
Uh, no, not really. I know that uh, I, I thought that the pitching aspect of, of doing uh, good things was, was uh, something that I, I was pretty sharp at, and I enjoyed that part of it. But, uh, uh, you know, I never messed with uh, with his fielding, and I don't think he, Ron ever messed with the different <laughs> pitches I should be throwing to certain hitters. But we used to discuss strategy on guys uh, that hit the ball straight away and guys that like to pull, that type of thing. Okay. Now, uh, were you ever the victim of, or did you ever play any practical jokes uh, with Mr. Santo? Oh, Ronnie? Oh, yeah. We used to dig. His name was Dig. We called him Dago. We used to play jokes on Ronnie all the time. There was a, a time when in 1969 when uh, the Mets or somebody with the Met organization or the, the New York fans said that they were going to shoot him. They were going to put a bomb in his car, all kinds of stuff. So Billy Williams and Glenn Becker played a practical joke by using uh, the uh, Whirlpool timer, put it in a box, wrapped it up, and put it in his mail chute. And he went in to get his mail to hear this ticket. So he took the box out, threw it over the left field wall over on Waveland, on Waveland Avenue. And the, our team trainer, Al him and said, Hey, that damn clock cost 20 bucks. You better replace it. I need another clock. <laughs> Do you think Ron was more competitive as a broadcaster or as a player? Oh, big time as a player. I mean, he got disappointed as a broadcaster knowing that certain – plays certain uh, games should have been won a certain way and being an ex-player he knew how to play the game the right way and it's really unfortunate to, as a broadcaster you could hear it in his voice on a daily basis when they weren't playing well yeah. now as a teammate what what did you make of it when you would see him click his heels well that was all started by leo de Rocher. and most people thought that leo was a phenomenal guy which he was and ronnie he was a team captain and, you know, we had a pretty good series against somebody, the Cardinals or the Mets. And after the game, he ran down the line, and Leo said, hey, click your heels. When we win a ball game at home, that's what I want you to do. And that's what Ronnie did. And it wasn't really Ronnie's doing to start that. It was Leo's. Do you think that that basically hurt Santos' chance for the Hall of Fame, that they thought he was a showboat? I don't think so. I think after a while, you, it was said a couple of times that, Players thought he was showing them up, but I mean, he just did it as a gesture of winning ball games, and the fans wanted to see him do it. And after a while, it became pretty much commonplace when we won a lot of games at home. That's what Ronnie did. Thank you very much, Fergie. We really appreciate you taking some time to talk about your old buddy and teammate, Ron Santo. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to be there to, on Friday. I'll be, I'll be one of the Paul Bears. All righty. Thank see you. See you then. Thank All you. Right, take care. All okay, right. Bye bye now.